Appreciate everyone that prayed today. I know that even if you didn't come down, you were praying uh, for Verlin there and Joey and the family. Uh, they very much desire their, your prayers. and uh, We don't know what God has, you know. Um, there again, we don't know what God has for any of us. Amen. This afternoon could be it. Yeah. But there's a surety that God exists, amen? amen. That he is the creator. And that he has all the power and ability within him. This morning, a uh, focus verse that I'd like to talk with you about, and if you have your Bibles and want to turn there, is in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and the 18th verse. And as we begin to look and, and hear what God was speaking to us, the, the, the whole idea of today is God's rescue. God's rescue. And here in the book of Timothy, as Paul was writing, we understand that, the, that this last book that he wrote to Timothy, in other words, a letter of instruction, encouragement, and everything, was probably one of the last things that Paul did, and it was not very long before that he would be killed. He'd give his life for the gospel. And he says something here in this 18th verse that just really stuck with me, and this is coming from the NIV version. He says, Paul speaking, knowing that his time is coming near. He said, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Paul had followed God or followed the life of Christ for many years. For many years before that, he... He pursued religion, and in pursuing religion, he thought he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was actually working against Christ. But as he had that road of Damascus, or excuse me, on his road there, as he was walking, he had an encounter with Jesus. And after that time, Paul was no more the same. He was changed forever. It doesn't mean that his life was a bowl of cherries, as we might say. It doesn't mean that everything was great and wonderful. In fact, he probably suffered more after coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ than he ever did before. But it was all for the glory of God. And he understood that Jesus was the only way, the only way to salvation. He understood that Jesus was the greatest rescue that ever took place. But as we think about rescues, we think about a lot of things that happened back in the Old Testament. We want to talk about a few of those this morning here and as we begin to get into the Word. And the first thing that I think about of a rescue is, rescue is, is when, when something shows up in a situation that, that it seems is, is hopeless. There is no way out of, and something shows up and causes that situation to change. In the sense of the Bible, God rescued his children, the children of Israel, so many times in the face of unsurmountable odds and in, in situations that by the way man would look at it, there would be no hope, no hope for the situation to be any different. But praise be to God, he shows up and it changes. First thing I think about is Moses, when he was leading the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. They've seen the plagues, they've seen what happened over there and all the things that happened. And finally, uh, they let them go and they're, they're headed out in a direction. And they come up on the Red Sea and the Red Sea was very deep, it was very wide. And, it, and at that time, they looked back and they saw the Egyptians coming after them. Saw the cloud of dust. Probably could hear the roar of the horses and the chariots. And here they stand between the Egyptian army, the greatest army on the earth at that time, and the Red Sea. And they had no boats. They had no way to go. A very terrible situation. People begin to say, why didn't you just leave us in Egypt? We, there wasn't there enough graves for us to be buried in there? They knew that it was over. But God speaks to Moses, and as he speaks to Moses, 
In Exodus 14 and 16, he tells Moses what to do. He says, raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the waters so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. Word says in verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night the Lord drove back the sea with a great east wind and turned it into dry ground. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. With a wall of water on their right and on their left, they all went through. Now let's look at this situation for just a moment. They're stranded there. They have no hope. They have, they have nothing to war against the Egyptians with. They have no chariots. They have no weapons with them. When they came out of Egypt, they took what they had, plus a lot of plunder that the Egyptians gave them. But they had no weapons. And here they are in a situation that is very dire. They see their life about to end, and God shows up on the situation. God speaks to Moses, his man. He says, do this, what I'm telling you to do. And he said, when you raise your arms up, the waters will part. Now, What a great feat that is. Now, I've heard people say, and and, and people in the past have said that, well, at that time of the year, the sea wasn't very deep there. You know, it wasn't wasn't much to it. And, And that possibly, you know, they try to explain a miracle of God. They try to explain away the greatness of what happened there. But the truth of the matter is God showed up, and God changed the situation. That is the only way that things will change is when God is working in that situation. God speaks to Moses, tells him to divide the waters by his hand. It wasn't Moses doing the work. God was doing it. Moses was just a display of that. And as the waters parted back, it said the ground was dry. How many times have you ever been out in the ocean and the bottom of it be dry? Even if the water came in and went back out, what is it? It's wet, isn't it? I think about down here in Lake Gunnersville. I think about walking out in that old murky bottom. Things cannot dry up that quick, people. But the Word tells us multiple times that the children of Israel walk to safety on dry ground. Amen. That's a God that I want to serve. That is the only God that we need in our life today. He said all through the night. Do you know about how many people walked across there? The Bible tells us there's about 600 men, not counting the women and the children, 600,000. Now, how long does it take to get 600,000 people across? Miraculous things happen. And then the next thing that happens is, is the children of Israel get on the other side. The Egyptian army is pursuing after them. He's coming after them any, after, uh, to kill them. They have no weapons. Again, they're in a situation, and then God closes the sea back up amen to those that might say that the water wasn't that deep it's amazing that the great egyptian army was destroyed with just a little bit of water god is in control you see god shows up he rescues his people he rescues those that call out unto him moses called out unto god for the safety of the children of israel The next thing I want to talk about is is the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know the the, the situation is King Nebuchadnezzar had built this great statue, and he wanted everybody to worship it. And at a certain time when the music sounded, they were supposed to bow down and worship the statue, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't. That wasn't their God. They served the true and the living God. And as a result of it, they brought before the king, and he told him, he said, Is it true that you will not bow down and worship my image? And they said, oh, king, we can't. We can't. He told them, he said, I'm going to bind you, and I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace so that you'll be destroyed. And he becomes so mad and so angry, he told the people, he said, heat the furnace seven times greater than it is normally heated. So they began to heat the furnace up, and it got so hot that when they bound them up, and the word tells us that when the men throw the people into the fire, it killed the men that was throwing them into the fire. That's how hot it was. Yeah. People might say, well, fire wasn't that great. It killed the great men that threw them into the fire. 
You see, God is at work here. Then the word tells us down there, it says that Nebuchadnezzar looks inside of the furnace to see what's happened. And he says, didn't we send three men into the furnace? And they said, oh, king, you're right. He said, I see four men walking about in the furnace, not bound. And he said, and the fourth is like unto the Son of God. After that, the men came out. It said the word tells us that they didn't even smell of smoke. Their garments were not singed. There was nothing wrong with them. God showed up. God rescued those people. Those people could have had an opportunity to deny God and say, Oh, king, you're right. We're going to worship you because we don't know what's going to happen. But they say to the king, Oh, king, we don't know what's going to happen. But our God is great enough. Amen. He is great enough to rescue us. And even if he doesn't, he is still God. Amen. What a testimony. He he called the people together and he told them, he said, let the God of Shadrach and Abednego be glorified. You see, God rescues people. And now the greatest rescue of all. Scripture that we find here is in Romans 5 and 8. It says, but God proves his own love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Folks, that's the greatest. Th- that's the greatest scripture. What he said is, is the people that were there at that time. They weren't serving God. Now, they were going through ritualistic service. They were showing up on the Sabbath. They were doing what they were supposed to do. But their lives were not following what God wanted. There were people that would even curse God. Say he's not a God. Where has he been? We we haven't heard from him in 400 years. And, And the word says that even when God saw that, Even when he saw that he was being rejected, mocked, and pushed aside, he said, he sent Jesus to die for me and to die for you. Think about that. He didn't have to do that, did he? No. Mankind was sinful. Mankind had walked away from God. Mankind had got to a point that they only worshipped him in ritual. But yet, he said, I love them so much. I love them so much that I myself am going to take up on a body and I'm going to go to that earth and I'm going to live a perfect life and that I may lay it down and be the final sacrifice that has to be made. The blood of Jesus would be shed For a once and final sacrifice. No longer will the blood of animals and goats be acceptable. It was only by the blood of Jesus that we might be able to attain salvation. You see, God rescues. You say, well, I have been in a bad situation for a long time. God hasn't rescued me. I've called out to him, and I've said, God, I need this, I need this, I need that. My marriage is falling apart. Work is falling apart. I'm falling apart. I have this addiction. I can't get rid of it. People may have called out and said, God, fix this situation. Well, you see, there's a little bit of difference. It's when people call out to God and say, God, I need you, and I need you. To show up on this situation and work like you want to. There's where the difference comes. Many years ago, I was in a very tough place, very dark place. Things just weren't working for me at work and had a lot of pressure. And things just seemed not to be working at all. And I'd pray to God, God, fix it, take this out of the way, make this go this way, make this go that, all of this. And it never got any better. For nine months, I lived in a pure, immortal hell. It was bad. 
But you know, one night, I finally got to the point that I had to have relief. I couldn't make another step forward. And that night, I got humble before God. I got down. I prayed, God, I don't know what you want, what you're trying to do. But whatever it is, your will be done. You know, immediately he spoke to me. And he told me what he wanted to do. He wanted to preach his word. Hadn't really crossed the mind before. But you see, God used the situations. I don't think he caused the situations. But he used those situations in my life to get me to that point that I was humble enough that I'd say, God, what you want, not what I want. And honestly, I was to the point, I didn't care what he said. I was going to do it. Couldn't go another step forward. Maybe you're here today and you need a rescue. Maybe there's something in your life that you've been struggling with. There's something that has got you bound down in the chains of Satan. That's what was happening to me. I was believing all the lies of Satan. Maybe those chains that Satan's put upon you need to be cut. Today is the day it can happen. Maybe you're in a situation that there's some addiction of some kind or some type in your life. You've been trying to fight it for years, and you can't get free of it. You need Jesus' rescue. You need the rescue of God, and you've got to get humble before him. You may say, God, you fix this this way, you fix it that way, and everything will be okay. When you get humble with him, and you get to the point you say, God, it's yours. You do what you want. I've got to have this relief. Maybe you're in a situation with your marriage. Maybe you're in a situation at work, as we said before. Whatever the situation is that you're struggling with today, you need to come and you need to give it over to God and say, you work it out, God. I don't have a preconceived idea of how it needs to work because my ideas are worthless. Imagine me trying to tell God how to fix something. How ridiculous is that? I think we've all been there at certain times. Whatever it is that you're struggling with today, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. You hear, Jesus is the answer. It don't matter what it is. You just say the problem, and Jesus is the answer. As they come and they bring a song this morning, I ask you to stand to your feet, and I want you to consider, do you need a rescue this morning? And if you do, you don't have to come down here to this front of this stage, but it's an awesome place to come and get humble with God. Right. Fellow brothers and sisters will come and, and, and pray for you and pray with you. But you've got to get to the point that you say, God, your way, not mine.